Welcome to worship. Let us be gathered with words from the psalmist. I invite you to stand in body of spirit. The Lord is before us, clearing that path that we might gather here. Our, our way, way is sure, and our feet are light, light as we enter to the beauty of the cross of Jesus. Let our hearts celebrate, let joy abound. With, with our bodies and minds, be confident that the Lord will teach us the way of life. In the Lord's presence is celebration. Let us look at the Lord.
we read from Romans. In his letter to the Romans, Paul writes of his struggle with sin. Even though he's redeemed through Christ's death and resurrection, he says, I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the things that I hate. We can understand the struggle between following the law of love versus the law of self. We are saints and sinners. For this reason, we come together and pray to the Lord. In Christ, we have been set free. No longer does sin control us. In this freedom, we can love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Great, Great is God, God saving from us. Though we try to live by the Spirit, we often turn back to the yoke of human brokenness. Rather than love, joy, and peace, we give an end to the division of our rest, feeling angry and anxious. Instead of patience, kindness, and generosity, we hoard your gift as we believe the lies of scarcity. We hand over faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, accepting instead our culture's growing lack of compassion and increasing our But God of our redemption, we know this small living is not your hope for us. Save us from ourselves. Let us live by the Spirit. In Christ, we have been set free. No longer does any control us. Amen. <clears throat> Receive now these words of forgiveness. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with its passions and its desires. In the name of Jesus Christ, Christ we are now forgiven. <laughs> Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you all, and also. And also. Please take a moment to greet one of the little signs to us. Let us pray. We have come to see what the Lord has done. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds so that we may go into the world and participate in what God is doing. Our mind holds certain images from the Sunday schools of our youth. The burning bush, David fighting Goliath, Jesus walking on the water, and the one we'll hear today. The story will be told from the beginner's Bible, so let us come with the faith of a child as we receive God's word. A reading from the Hebrew scriptures in the beginner's Bible for children. A man named Elisha was plowing the field. God chose Elisha 
to be Elijah's helper. Over the year, they traveled together and they told many people about God's love. One day, they stopped beside a river. Elijah took off his coat and struck the water with it, and the river opened up, and they walked across on a dry path. Elijah was getting older. God was preparing to take him to heaven. Elijah asked Elisha if there was anything he wanted. Elisha answered, I want a double portion of the spirit God has given to you. Suddenly, a fiery chariot pulled by fiery horses came down from the sky. It separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind to be with God. Elijah's coat fell to the ground, and Elisha picked it up. He struck the water with it, and the water parted. Then Elisha knew that God had granted his request. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Well, the story Jan read for us is one most of us learned in childhood. We could all picture the whirlwind since growing up in the Midwest. We were very familiar with tornado drills. And who doesn't like chariots and horses on the fire? But what you may not have heard is the story that comes next. Even though Elijah's path hadn't been Elisha's, Elisha accompanied him as he was in the habit of doing. Maybe he hoped he could talk Elijah out of leaving him, or maybe he wasn't ready to be on his own yet. But now Elijah is gone, and we join Elisha as he looks up to the heavens. Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him, and they bowed to the ground before him, and they said to him, See now. We have 50 strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. <coughs> Elisha responded, no, do not send them. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send them. So they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find Elijah. And when they came back to Elisha, he remained in Jericho. He said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? We don't know how long Elisha stayed in the wilderness. I mean, after all, what was he going to say and what was he going to do? He was a farm boy from the hills of Samaria, and the only training he had for this was his short time with Elijah. Elisha knows that he can't stay in the wilderness and will have to find a way back across the Jordan. And Elisha knows that the company of prophets will be looking to him for leadership. And he knows that the word of God must still be proclaimed and truth must continue to be spoken to power. Elisha knows all of this. But Elisha also knows that he cannot do these things in his own strength and power as he cries out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? We're not told that Elisha received a revelation from God that made the way clear. 
In that moment with his clothes torn in mourning, we have no word that he experienced a peace that surpasses all understanding. What we do have is a word that Elijah immediately, Elisha immediately picks up Elijah's mantle. Elisha accepts the leadership God is calling him to and begins to walk through the wilderness. Soon Elisha is standing on the bank of the Jordan River, knowing that the company of prophets is waiting for him. Now this company of prophets have been stalking him and Elijah as they travel from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to the Jordan River. And though they're the same uh, members of the prophetic community, when they reach the Jordan River, the company of prophets stops and waits as Elijah and Elisha journey into the wilderness. As a result, they don't see the whirlwind, nor do they witness the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. They do not see Elijah taken up into heaven. They only see Elisha return alone. They see that his clothes have been torn in mourning. They see that he carries Elijah's mantle. And so the company bows down, accepting and affirming his leadership that God has laid upon him. And after all, they saw him split the Jordan in two. However, they struggle with Elijah's departure. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Who goes to heaven in a whirlwind? And we can see our shared humanity as they ask for something to do. They want to search for Elijah because he's disappeared before. You remember his running away after defeating the priests of Baal? But we know they aren't going to find Elijah. The company of prophets ask for Elisha's permission to look for Elijah, and Elisha tells them not to go, but finally gives in so they'll stop pestering him. Elijah is gone, but life must go on, and so once the company of prophets have left on their wild goose chase, Elisha returns to Jericho. The people of the city come out to meet him so they can fix, we can fix his water problem. Now the people of the city said to Elisha, the location of this city is good as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And then he went to the spring of water and he threw the salt into it and said, thus says the Lord, I have made this water wholesome. From now neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been wholesome to this day, according to the word Elijah spoke. Now I kind of think it's funny that they say the location of the city is good, but the water's bad and the land's unfruitful. And so I guess what they say in real estate is true, location, location, location. Now, I expect that the people imagine that Elijah's ministry would be the same as Elijah's. I mean, why wouldn't it be after all? Because they were the same people with the same string of bad kings and never any more. However, Elisha comes up with an unconventional solution. Fill a brand new bowl of salt and throw it in water. What would have Elisha done? I don't know. But Elisha's actions are similar to those of Moses when he threw a piece of wood into the bitter waters at Marah and made it sweet. Elisha goes a step further because the water is not only drinkable, it's life-giving. And Elisha rightly says, thus says the Lord as he throws the salt into the spring, because the Lord is not done speaking just because Elisha is gone. And so maybe the message of Elisha's actions is that Elisha's ministry is not the same as Elisha's, because they're different people but they serve the same God. God is not done speaking and doing new and miraculous things among God's people. The God of Elijah and Elisha, our God, is the one who separates water so the journey of discipleship can continue, despite our sojourn in the land of oppression and the wilderness of grief. 
Our God is the one who can somehow take that which causes suffering and bitterness and bring forth living water. Our God restores. Our God provides. Our God is with us. But this tale isn't over yet. Elisha went up there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go away, bald head! Go away, bald head! And when he turned and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled the forty-two boys. From there he went to Mount Carmel and then to the Now, I hope you've heard the story of the she-bears before because it's such a good story to get the attention of middle schoolers. <laughs> And I don't think we should tell this story as some sort of a monster's going to get you if you don't eat your vegetables. It's a cautionary tale, but I don't see it as a threat. The story at the beginning of Elisha's ministry concludes with this odd account of a jeering horde of boys. And based on the Hebrew, people try to explain it away as it being more of a gang of young men, at least 42 of them, threatening Elisha. Others see it as Elisha flexing his prophetic muscle. Maybe. Or maybe this is a statement that God won't be mocked. It's a charge to all of us. Jesus was very clear about the responsibility of discipleship, and he wasn't just talking about the prophets. Some of us are called into ordained ministry, but we are all the church together. We are the priesthood of believers. God's call on all of our lives is serious and sacred. Elisha's ministry continues to be a bit quirky, and I like that because quirky keeps us on our toes. It reminds us that God is always doing something new. God's work goes on regardless of who is wearing the mantle. And while there may be grief, such as the loss of Elijah, or frustration, <clears throat> does he really need a new bowl? Or consequences, like those she bears, God is with us in all of it. At the waters of the Jordan, Elisha calls out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? We learn here that God is still with Elisha, still with the people, still with us. Amen. And let us pray. God of chariots and horses of fire, of rivers split in two, of mantles to pick up, of new bowls and salt, of sheep ears from the woods, we find ourselves on many paths during these lives of ours. Some are easier than others, and we can find ourselves on a road that we would rather not be on, going to a place that we do not want to go. And sometimes we cry out, Where are you, Lord? We give thanks that you are with us in times of loss, uncertainty, and change. And we give thanks because you are not done doing new things. And we give thanks because you are with us always. May we be faithful as you've been faithful to us in our words and actions. May you be glorified. Amen. <laughs>
As we bring our prayers before God, we'll continue to reflect on God's words from Isaiah 58. Faithful God, you have gathered us here to worship you, hoping that what we offer is pleasing to you. We pray that we understand correctly what it means to be your people, and when we misunderstand that we would be open to correction, we hear your word to us. You say, is not this the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Lord, you tell us that when we act justly and work to end oppression, it is an act of worship. In this moment of prayer, we lift up those who work so tirelessly. Protect them as they speak truth to power with both their words and their bodies. Create within us the faith to stand alongside them, the courage to learn where we are agents of injustice, the humility to admit that we need to change. Help shield those who continue their long wait for justice and equality or hopelessness. Help heal them from the wounds of racial trauma and other prejudice. Let us listen and believe their stories. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them, not to hide yourself from your own kin? Abundant God, we have shared our bread with the hungry and provided cover for the naked. It is much more difficult to bring the homeless into our houses and not hide ourselves when we are tired of giving. May the vulnerability we see in others allow us to be vulnerable. As a community, let us not judge those who struggle. Instead, may we see your God image in them. For those who are in desperate physical need, we ask for you to provide them comfort for their bodies and souls. May we see sharing as a blessing both bestowed and received. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Sovereign God, the dawn is sometimes difficult to see. For those who are sick or mourning the dead, may you bring healing quickly. For health care providers, may you provide the strength and wisdom they need for their work. For those facing unemployment, continuing job loss, or overwhelming medical and financial obligations, may they receive hope. May, the, may they feel the strength of your glory supporting and loving them. Then you shall call, the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and the Lord will say, Here I am. Lord, you must hear us calling to you for help. We stand here together waiting for your answer. 
remove the weight of fear from among us, satisfy the needs of the afflicted with the light in the darkness. Guide us in our parched places to the spring of waters whose waters never fail. From the ruins, rebuild us and the world to more closely resemble your kingdom. We hear and believe that you are here. God, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. In our shared hope, we join our voices to pray together, each using the words we find most familiar, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, the call to offering is often seen as the time we reach for our purses and wallets. And it is true that money does make the world go round. However, God's call to offering is more than our treasure. God's call calls us to pick up the mantle of discipleship with our time, talent as well. What shall we offer God today? Reveal our 
story of JL last year too, so maybe it's just, I don't know. But um, I, I think this, this idea that God won't be mocked, uh, like I said, people can see it as a threat. Like, don't you dare, like, challenge God. And I don't think scriptures say that at all. I think the Psalms are full of people challenging God. I think that the story is, uh, maybe we could take it more that um, the call that God puts on our lives is real. We shouldn't belittle it or make it small because God won't be mocked. And if God is calling you to this life of discipleship, to act in ways of compassion and justice and love, then um, we join good company and may we go out and do the same. In the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit this day and all days. Go in peace. Amen. 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 Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes